If we're to be an authentic Christ follower, we must go the way of our master. We must go the way of the cross and accept each other in the Lord. Let's pray as we stand. Father God, we pray that your spirit who caused these words to be written would open our eyes to their meaning and help us believe them. Amen. Amen. Please do take a seat and do uh, grab a Bible and look uh, back to Philippians chapter 4 so that you can uh, have a look at uh, what we're looking at this evening. Uh, Do also use your uh, service sheets to take notes if you'd so like to do so, or maybe to fan yourself or the person sitting next to you, because it is indeed a little bit hot. Well, I don't know if you spotted this, uh, but it seems to me that every decent preacher uh, has some great and uh, hair-raising story about getting into desperate trouble um, in the sea. Uh, They've gone out surfing or swimming or scuba diving, and they've had a great time splashing around and bobbing around in the water, until they suddenly realize that they're getting dragged uh, by the current out to sea, or they're perilously close to the jagged cliffs at the end of the bay, so that their life quite literally hangs in the balance. It's very tension-filled. I was racking my brains uh, earlier on this uh, week um, to see if I had any such stories, and I remembered a time a few years ago when we took uh, the young people away for our week away in the summer, um, and we went surfing with them, Uh, There were only eight surfboards and uh, I think eight uh, youth, so uh, uh, I uh, gave the young people use of them and hopped onto a bodyboard um, because I'm just so sacrificial and servant-hearted and actually didn't want to make a complete and utter fool of myself. Uh, But whatever our mode of transport was, we kind of um, fired out there into the surf and we enjoyed fighting our way out there and then trying to catch a wave to get kind of... Uh, race back in. But after about half an hour or so, we realized that we had drifted about 20 yards uh, down the beach, and we were closer to the rocks than we would like to be. So this is the tension bit. You ready for the tension bit? What did we do? We got out. I went back to the middle of the beach, and we started all over again. Now, that is the lamest trouble uh, in the sea uh, story you will ever hear uh, from a pulpit. Um, It's not got anything on that I got sucked out to sea and couldn't swim back for the life of me story, or that I was rescued from within feet of having my brains dashed in by the rock story, or even the Bethany Hamilton uh, story, Soul Surfer, where this young girl is out surfing and she gets her arm ripped off by a 15-foot shark, but somehow still manages to get back to the shore and to hospital before her blood runs out um, and is able to tell the story Um, in a way that shows her faith coming through and has inspired thousands. If you haven't got your summer read sorted out for this summer, then I thoroughly recommend that one. Uh, But even though my story is lacking somewhat on the drama, it is still a clear visual aid to one of the great dangers of the Christian life. And that is the danger of spiritual drift. As falling away from faith isn't always spectacular, it can happen so easily that we can hardly notice it. We can be on fire for the Lord early on in our Christian lives, but then very gradually we get busy with other things and our priorities change so that when we finally look up, we see that we have drifted so far away from Jesus Christ that we can barely see him. Dragged away on the currents of the world's perspectives and concerns. Well, this passage that we're going to look at tonight in Philippians chapter 4 is all about spiritual drift. Can you see that there in chapter 4, verse 1? Therefore, my brothers, you whom I long, love and long for, my joy and my crown, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. Now, the word here used for stand firm is the same as a soldier standing firm in battle with the enemy surging down on him. And Paul says, stand firm against the drift. The commentator Lightfoot says this about this passage. In the same way that believers are condemned to fight for their lives, against them arrayed the ranks of worldliness and sin. Only unflinching courage and steady togetherness can win the victory against such odds. So Paul cries out to these believers who he has brought to the Lord, 
and he's nurtured in their faith. And now as dear friends, as brothers, as his joy and crown, he warns them not to drift away. So this sermon may be for you tonight, as you are gently drifting on the tide and in danger of being dragged steadily, if unspectacularly, away from Christ. But it may also be for you if you are fighting to encourage and equip others in the faith, but are struggling to know just quite how to do that. As the Apostle Paul gives us three commands which we need to heed ourselves or encourage others with in order to stand firm in the Lord. Here's the first one in verses 2 to 3. Agree with each other in the Lord. I plead with Yodia, I plead with Syntyche, to agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. You know, the word plead here literally means begging on his knees. So the Apostle Paul is hundreds of miles away in prison in Philippi, and he is begging these women to be reconciled to one another. And the first thing that these two women teach us is that the Christian life is not problem-free. They teach us that there is disunity and dispute lurking in our hearts. So you may think that you are the most wonderfully loyal church member, and I really hope that you are. But that does not mean that dispute and disunity cannot lurk in your heart. We simply do not wake up every morning with a perfectly angelic disposition. No, despite the fact that these two women have clearly been converted, as verse 3 says, their names are in the book of life. And they've also been fine Christian workers. As Paul also says, they have contended at my side, working together to proclaim the gospel. Yet despite those two facts, they are now at each other's throats. Now, some have rather cruelly nicknamed these two women odious and so touchy. But you wouldn't find me lowering myself to such cheap gags as that, especially as we don't really know what their disagreement actually is all about here. It can't have been a major doctrinal issue. Otherwise, Paul would have just set them straight. He would have said, Yodi is right. Sintichi, so spot on, just agree with her. But no, here he is appealing to them both. So though we don't know what the nature of this issue is, there is one thing that we can be certain of. The feelings of both these women have been terribly hurt. And ultimately, their hurt feelings were more important to them than gospel unity. They could not place their hurt feelings on one side and be reconciled together. So that once more, they could contend together for the sake of the gospel. Now, I don't want for a minute to knock feelings. We all have feelings, and they're a perfectly legitimate, God-given human emotion. But often we have to choose. We have to choose whether we're going to give our hurt feelings authority or whether we're going to allow Jesus Christ and following him to have the authority. We have to choose. Hurt feelings or following Christ. Which is why Paul pleads with these two women to agree in the Lord. Now that phrase there is is pretty much exactly the same wording as Paul uses in that famous second chapter of this letter, where he says those incredible words of verse 5, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. As he's essentially saying to them here, in this dispute, in this tension, when you're furious when you are so mad that I've even heard about it hundreds of miles away, in that situation, have the attitude of Christ. Think like him. And how does Jesus think? Well, that's chapter 2, verse 6, where Paul says of Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. So Jesus Christ, even though he's high king of all heaven, does not snatch at what is rightfully his. Look how she treated me. You wouldn't believe what he did to me. 
No, instead in a staggering act of self-giving, he gets down off his throne and he heads towards the cross. He humbles himself and he becomes obedient to a slave's death, to a criminal's death. So what will you do? How far will you go to have your your relationships reconciled? You must think like Christ thinks, says Paul. You must go the way of the cross. You must humble yourself and, and make the first move and reach out to others. I received an email um, a few weeks ago that made me so angry I actually wanted to kind of slam the laptop shut. It was highly critical of something I'd done, um, and unfairly so in my opinion. And even if the criticism was justified, uh, there was no positive, constructive suggestions on uh, how uh, I might fix things. The whole tone was arrogant, and, um, and I found it altogether uh, condescending, so much so it made me mad. By the way, you needn't worry, it is nobody here. Um, that, would, that would be really awkward, wouldn't it, if I was to uh, just reveal why I didn't reply to Ian Garrett's email. That would be really, really awkward. Um, but the question is, how do you handle it when you receive a message like that? How do you handle it? Well, you can't cope with stuff like that unless you have the attitude of Christ. But the world doesn't think like that. The world we live in files it. You offend me, I file it. I offend you, you file it. It's written down up here, isn't it? I'll remember that, I'll get you back. The Christian community led by Jesus Christ does not do that though. We don't let the devil get a foothold with our anger like that. Or we shouldn't. Instead, as Jesus went as low as he could possibly go to the cross, we swallow our pride and we do not stand on our dignity and on our rights. Now, who do you need to forgive or ask forgiveness from? Is there a relationship, a rivalry, a tension? Perhaps there's a stony silence that has gone on for years, decades even. Who do you need to speak to? What do you need to do? Well, I don't know. If you're anything like me, I hate apologizing. I suspect that uh, there are many here that are like that too. When it comes to saying sorry, I find I get a case of BSE. We blame someone else, don't we? That's what we want to do. And there are many who just will not apologize and will not forgive. And particularly if we're British, uh, we, we like to just shut the door on these things and pretend they're not there. But Paul says this must not happen. If we're to be an authentic Christ follower, we must go the way of our master. We must go the way of the cross and accept each other in the Lord. And if we don't do that, do you know what happens? We drift. We drift spiritually as we harden our heart to the Lord and to his word. So that's commandment number one. Here's number two. Rejoice in the Lord always. There it is in verse four uh, again, isn't it? Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Now here's a quick uh, quiz question for you. Do you know the difference between human happiness and Christian joy? This is so important. It's vital, this. Because many Christians have been rendered inoperative by the devil because they don't understand the difference. And they give up on the Christian life when it does not deliver human happiness. So what is human happiness? Well, when in doubt, what do you do? You Google it. So in preparing uh, for this sermon, I did a bit of Googling. I Googled, what is happiness? And my favorite answer among the myriad of things that Google threw at me was the definition of happiness from the Charlie Brown cartoons. Happiness is a warm puppy. That's a great picture, isn't it? As sweet as a sweet little puppy gambles into the room and just snuggles up close to you. That's happiness. Unless, of course, you get asthma from dogs. Uh, But uh, other than that, that's happiness. But what was interesting about everything that Google came up with, whether it was puppies or money or exotic holidays, a romantic relationship, seeing the sunshine for more than two days uh, a year, or simply having a good laugh with friends. The key to happiness, according to the internet, is that it is externally stimulated. It all depends on getting my environment and my surroundings just right. And so the question for the Christian is, do you secretly long to live the life of the shiny, happy people? You know the people you see in the adverts where the message is that because they've bought a certain product, 
They are now healthy, fit, good-looking, stylishly dressed, wealthy, organized, happily married, with contentedly obedient, yet endearingly mischievous children, living in a beautiful, tidy, spacious house with a five-acre garden, a treehouse, and a stream. That's the picture you get from the adverts, isn't it? And their happiness depends on external circumstances. They are never content with life unless they get the shiny, happy things. But in point of fact, they aren't even happy then. Because what happens when, to the happiness when reality hits? When your kids get old and they stop trampling all over your feet and they start trampling all over your heart. Or the feelings of romance start to fade as the, the relationship just isn't working out. Or the money runs out and you just don't know kind of where you're going to be able to pay the bills from. What happens when we have to live with unrelenting demands or failing health or loneliness or whatever the burdens of your heart are this evening? What happens when the external stimuli to happiness fails? Well, for the Christian, they can still find joy because Christian joy is not external, but it's internal as it all depends on having a relationship with someone. Can you see that there in verse 4? You have to rejoice in the Lord. We can rejoice whatever the circumstances because our relationship with Christ is the anchor, which may seem like a bit of a holy platitude to you, but look what makes it real in the next verse, in verse 5. What is central to this relationship is the fact that the Lord is near. And it's clear that when he says the Lord is near, Paul is make, undoubtedly making two points. He's undoubtedly talking about Jesus' second coming. And he's undoubtedly talking about the presence of Jesus in our lives through the Holy Spirit now. You see, the Christian lives his or her life between these two reference points. The first coming of Jesus culminating in the cross and his resurrection. And the second point, when Jesus Christ returns. And I live my life between those two anchor points. They're what hold me. The cross of Christ and his second coming. They reassure me that I can be with Christ right now, whatever the circumstances, and I'm going home to be with him later. So my life is utterly secure in Christ. And therefore, I can, I really can not worry but rejoice even be happy because Paul says that these things that happen to me in this brief life of ours, as 2 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 15, they are just light and momentary troubles. In fact, the word that Paul uses about the struggles that we are going through now in this life is, is fluff. He literally says, in the light of Christ's death for me, in the light of his second coming, the troubles that I have at the moment, and boy, he had some troubles, didn't he? Imprisonment, beatings, uh, hardship, execution. He, but he says about them, it's, it's just light and momentary troubles. It's just fluff. For me, Philippians 1 verse 2, 21, to live is Christ, to die is gain. That's Paul's perspective. You see, because Paul knows that, that, that life is going somewhere, that there's a greater prize at the end, and that it's better to be there than to be here, he's ambivalent to the stuff of this world. To live is Christ, to die is gain. He says, I, I don't know which is better. I mean, I guess it's good for me to be here and to teach you about the gospel. But I'd love to go and be with Jesus. And our present troubles? Just fluff. That's how he sees it. So he says to the Philippian church, you too can rejoice, whatever you're going through, because Jesus is with you and he's coming back to take you home. And nothing is of greater worth than that. I don't know if you have um, ever read this book, In God's Underground, by Richard Wormbrand, but it tells the story of his 14 years in a communist jail where the guards were told when he went in that he was in there for child sacrifice. Now, can you imagine what that would do to the treatment you get that your guards were told that? Well, Wormbrand writes in that book of how it was possible to rejoice in the most horrific present circumstances. So he, writes, so he writes of an old Orthodox priest called Father Suriano, and he had this to say of him. Father Suriano had more reason to mourn than any of us. Tragedy had struck his whole family. One of his daughters, a cripple, had been deprived of her husband who was imprisoned with us. 
another daughter and her husband had been sentenced to 20 years in prison for their faith. One of his sons had died in prison. A second son had turned against him. And yet Father Soriano, a simple, self-educated man, spent his day encouraging and cheering others. He greeted people never with good morning, but always with the biblical rejoice. I asked him, how can you rejoice always? You've had so much misfortune. Why? It is a sin not to do so, he said. There is always good reason to rejoice. There is a God in heaven and in the heart. Look, now the sun is shining. Every day that you do not rejoice is a day lost, my son. You'll never have that day again. Now, I'm not expecting you to take this from me. I've had a fairly easy life so far. But take it from Father Soriano. You see, this man had learned to have a proper perspective on life. He knew the truth of those wonderful words. The Lord is near. And so he could rejoice, which is the second command. Here's Paul's third and final command that will help us avoid spiritual drift. Present your request to God. As Paul knows that the tyranny of circumstance can still keep us awake at night, even if we know those amazing words that the Lord is near. We can, as verse 6 says, be anxious about anything. The human heart and mind can fill with anxiety. So that when our head hits the pillow at night, we can toss and turn, trying to get to sleep as the anxieties of the day gnaw away at our mind. I wonder what it is that keeps you awake at night. And more to the point, what do you do about it? Do you just smile sweetly into the mirror in the morning as you sing Bobby McFerrin's classic 1990 song, Don't Worry, I'm not going to sing it just now, Don't Worry, Be Happy. Or maybe you take the stoically British route of, uh, of telling yourself to just pull yourself together, stiff up a lip, old boy, and all of that. And then again, maybe you sign up for a seven-week course on how not to worry called Anxiety Explored. There are absolutely no leaflets on the welcome desk for that. No leaflets at all. Because that's not what we're to do. What are we to do instead? Verse 6, we are not to be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Paul insists here that the antidote to anxiety is constant prayer. So of course we'll be knocked by something. Something will happen and we'll be sent reeling by it. But then, as we rediscover our equilibrium, we'll need to make a choice. Are we going to worry and fret and stress ourselves out about it and just waste away all our energy that way? Or will we take it to the Lord in prayer and trust him with it? That's what the the Apostle Paul says here. He says, will you please make the choice to pray? To remember who God is. To remember what he's done in the past. To remember his character, his goodness his righteousness, that his plans are so much better than your plans, to remember that he is your anchor point, where you've come from and where you're going. And as we do that, well, what will happen? This is amazing. Look at that promise in verse 7. And hold on to your seats. What's the promise? It's, not, it's the promise that God will do something. He will do something incredible. It doesn't say that, that God will take away the bad circumstances, but that God will put his peace into your heart. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So as we bring our worries to God and we're all knotted up inside by them and, and, and we're so troubled by them that we just can't keep our minds off them for more than a minute, God gives us his peace in exchange. Isn't that amazing? I bring my worries to him and in exchange he gives me his peace. And the peace here has a sense of oneness with God as this is a supernatural experience. We turn to God in prayer, and we will find something that we cannot find anywhere else. Don Carson has written about this verse. I have yet to meet a chronic warrior who enjoyed an excellent prayer life. That's very striking, isn't it? That's very striking. You see, either worry drives out prayer, or prayer drives out worry. So if you find yourself lying in bed at night, imagining the worst case scenarios of your life, what do you need to do? You need to get up and pray. Pour out your worries to the Lord and let your heart be garrisoned by a supernatural peace. So, where, how are you doing with all this? 
How are you doing? There's a lot there, isn't there? So maybe it might be good just to close by taking a little moment to think things through. Maybe there's one thing from this sermon that you need to act upon. So why not in the silence talk to the Lord? Take that step. Talk to the Lord and ask him to help you to act on his word. Let's do that right now. Father God, we ask that you would help us to have the mind of Christ. Give us his extraordinary humility as we deal with each other. And Father God, we ask that in difficult circumstances, you would give us your joy and your peace. Please help us not to drift from you, but to stick close, to heed these words and to stay in your presence at all times. For we love you so much for what you have done for us. Amen.